And just to get an idea of um, the audience here, um, can I get a show, show of hands for who's uh, from the Bay Area in the conference here? Okay. And how about uh, California or the West Coast? It's, and how about uh, uh, the U.S., uh, not the West Coast? It's, okay, great. <laughs> ah, okay. And uh, how about uh, coming out internationally? Wow, oh, that's great. That's great. So pretty diverse audience. Um, so, so I'm going to talk briefly on um, autonomic dysfunction in MSA, which uh, we know that is one of the earliest uh, symptoms, signs, and symptoms of MSA, uh, and is very debilitating for patients. And it's a, uh, you know, just to, looking at this graph uh, to get a sense, it's an incredibly uh, complicated um, field that. You know, you know. I don't fully understand completely. I don't think any of us who practice it do. It's uh, um, the, all these nerves um, innervate everything or supply um, everything in the body, you know, all the organs. Uh, it's kind of the uh, hidden nervous system, um, and we can only really measure it indirectly. Um, and um, the treatments are mostly based on symptoms, um, not necessarily. Uh, reversing the disease. Uh, but we tend to divide the autonomic nerves into two basic, for, two basic parts. Um, the sympathetic system, which is, you can think of the fight or flight nerves, or the parasympathetic system, which is sort of the rest and relaxation uh, nerves in our body. So if we divide the, um, the functions of these two uh, components, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, um, the sympathetic you can think of as responsible for uh, a lot of the blood pressure and heart rate changes um, that our bodies go through when we change position. Also sweating uh, is a sympathetic function. Uh, these are the things that um, if you were running away from attacker, uh, this system would be uh, in full effect. Uh, versus the parasympathetic system, which we can also call uh, you know, the rest and digest system. These are functions that we do when we're relaxed. Um, digestion, uh, urination, these are um, more parasympathetic functions, and also sleep, which is largely a parasympathetic state. And sleep is um, really an autonomic function. It's something that we don't have to think about uh, to do. Our bodies just, uh, just do it for us. So in medicine, when we're presenting, we always you know, want to present with cases so we get some kind of real-world example. Um, so this is a typical case that, that we would see in the autonomic clinic. A 65-year-old man with history of MSA is brought to the emergency department after a fall at home. His wife states that he has had frequent falls and may have lost consciousness on several occasions, most recently in the middle of the night when getting out of bed to urinate. He's unable to stand for more than a few minutes and has resorted to using a wheelchair whenever he le leaves the house. So in the emergency room, the doctors measure um, his blood pressure. And this is how we like to measure blood pressure um, in our clinic. You always want to do it lying flat. So your blood pressure is always going to be highest when you're lying flat because um, your body is not um, you know, fighting gravity, basically. So his blood pressure was quite high lying flat, at 180 over 100. A normal blood pressure would be you know, 120, 130 over 70 or 80 with a heart rate of 75. And then when he stands up, his blood pressure drops um, 80 points on the top number. And uh, normally when our blood pressure drops, you'd expect to see an increase in heart rate. The heart rate increases to kind of plump, pump blood to the brain to compensate. Um, but in his case, the heart rate didn't go up much. And this is pretty typical of MSA. Um, and two minutes later, the blood pressure has dropped even more to 90 over 60. But interestingly, uh, when we ask the patient how they're feeling, uh, most of us would have passed out uh, with this blood pressure change, but um, a lot of patients with MSA and, and these chronic autonomic problems um, don't really you know, feel all that lightheaded or maybe sometimes it's just feeling tired. Um, so, so he was referred for autonomic testing, and I'll just kind of show you what we do in the autonomic lab uh, when we evaluate patients. So the kind of notorious test that um, you may have heard about is the tilt table test. And contrary to um, what most people think, we don't flip patients upside down and, and spin them around or anything. Um, it's a very slow uh, increase in the table from flat to about 70 degrees. And usually we do this for about 10 minutes. And we don't, we, we don't like patients to pass out. Um, so we try not to let anyone pass out. Um, Everything is done non-invasively. We use a, uh, a finger cuff here um, that inflates 
um, around one of the fingers, and it measures blood pressure continuously uh, and heart rate. So what we can see are, are sudden changes or, or gradual changes, and we get a nice uh, graph of blood pressure. So in this particular patient, um, this is minute zero lying flat, and then when he was tilted upright, you can see the blood pressure kind of slowly drop, this, this kind of gradual ski slope here, um, and the heart rate doesn't increase much. So this is what we call orthostatic hypotension, uh, which we define as a blood pressure drop, top number, and we kind of focus more on the top number, top number of at least 20 points, uh, and it has to be sustained over several minutes. Uh, so the other, one of the other tests we do is, is called a Valsalva maneuver. This also measures similar things that the tilt table does, or changes in blood pressure um, with uh, uh, pressure changes inside inside the chest we have you blow into a tube uh, for a, a few seconds and then we measure the blood pressure response. So these are all tests designed to measure um, unconscious reflexes in the body. Another test that we, we frequently do is a test of sweating. Again, this is all painless. Um, there's a little tingling, uh, but it's, it's, it's not too painful. Uh, it's, this is called a QSART. We put these little capsules on the arm and the leg. Um, the capsules release a chemical called acetylcholine, which stimulates the sweat glands. And then we measure the response of the surrounding sweat glands to, to this chemical. And a normal response would be something like this. And you see this nice uh, kind of robust sweat response. Um, and actually, in MSA, we, we tend to uh, see a more normal response uh, versus Parkinson's, which is typically more abnormal. So autonomic testing can... Uh, be helpful not only for, you know, kind of quantifying a patient's symptoms, but also if doctors are a little, you know, unsure, as we usually are on if this is MSA or Parkinson's, um, sometimes tests like this can, uh, can give one clue to kind of uh, push it in one, you know, diagnosis or the other. Um, none of these tests are, there's no perfect test for diagnosis, so we try to, you know, get as many clues as we can uh, to help with a difficult diagnosis. So um, there's a lot of words on this slide. I just want to point out that, or make the point that orthostatic hypotension, this uh, blood pressure drop, it's, it's not always accompanied by uh, symptoms of lightheadedness or dizziness. Sometimes uh, patients can feel just tired. Um, you can get some uh, cramping in the muscles, especially in the, the shoulder muscles due to decreased blood flow. Um, you can have uh, nausea, um, ringing in the ears can happen before uh, you know, patients pass out due to decreased blood pressure. Sometimes shortness of breath is a common one due to decreased blood flow to the lungs. Um, and what we obviously want to avoid is, is loss of consciousness. Um, but a lot of patients that have had this problem for uh, many, many years, uh, we think that the brain sort of compensates for this low blood pressure, uh, and they may not uh, have as severe symptoms as um, someone who would develop this suddenly. Uh, so maybe a reason why some of the symptoms aren't as severe as you know we would expect with the huge drops in blood pressure. Um, so getting to the, the treatment of this, um, the drop in blood pressure, you know, the first step is to try to avoid things that can make it worse. So obviously dehydration, uh, you, it's very, it can be difficult to uh, convince patients to drink a lot of fluid uh, because of the uh, urinary uh, symptoms, having to go to the bathroom frequently. But um, the typical amount of fluid is, is at least, uh, you know, a couple liters a day, which is, you know, very difficult. Um, but, you know, two, two liters a day is a good um, thing to shoot for for, uh, for, for fluid. Uh, time of the day is important to know. Blood pressure is usually lowest in the morning, so you want to be very careful getting out of bed and just taking it slowly in the morning or in the middle of the night um, because everyone's blood pressure drops during sleep. Of course, you don't want to ride, jump up quickly. Um, you know, like most, most patients aren't doing that. Um, or stand in one place for a long period of time. Um, alcohol dilates blood vessels, so that's going to drop your blood pressure. Um, Carbohydrate heavy meals will drop your blood pressure. So uh, carbs are um, kind of notorious for, um, for this. These are you know, a heavy, a big pasta meal is the worst thing you can eat. Um, all the blood flow goes to your stomach and away from your brain. So we usually counsel patients to uh, eat smaller meals and, and try to stay away from the heavy carbs. 
which is a, which is a trend anyway, so that's, so that's uh, convenient. Um, and then when going to the bathroom, blood pressure can drop. Um, patients can pass out when doing that, uh, so that's just something to be aware of. So we talked about the, uh, the fluid. The other thing that, that can be useful before we try medications is uh, increasing salt. Another thing to, to mention is um, a lot of patients with, you know, with MSA that have low blood pressure standing also have quite high blood pressure laying flat, which we call supine hypertension. So um, when we see patients, we're always having them measure blood pressure at home um, over a, a week, at least a week uh, measuring lying blood pressure and standing to get a sense of the, um, the spectrum of, of blood pressure. But generally, we advise patients to increase salt to at least three grams a day. That's about a teaspoon of table salt to your meal. Uh, in extreme cases, 15 grams has been recommended. So, I mean, everything is an individual uh, for each patient. Because of the supine um, high blood pressure, the high blood pressure laying flat, uh, the first thing that you that we always tell patients to try is increase the head of the bed at night to around 30 degrees to um, minimize those high blood pressures laying flat during the night. Um, compression stockings are, you know, commonly recommended by a lot of doctors. Um, I found them to be, you know, pretty uncomfortable for patients to put on, and the benefit is, you know, not not so great. Um, one thing that can be easier and, and can give uh, uh, more benefit is actually an abdominal binder, like for back pain, because there's a lot of blood in the abdomen, and, and that kind of pushes it, you know, a little higher to the brain. It's easier to put on. Um, counter. So one uh, one last thing to mention is is drinking water, drinking especially cold water, a small glass like we have here, um, as quickly as you can will increase your blood pressure by 30 to. Uh, 40 points, top number. Um, so it's it's an incredibly uh, yeah, kind of um, vigorous response that that happens in the stomach. It's a stomach reflex, and this is something that not a lot of people are aware of. So you know, if you're feeling lightheaded and you think your blood pressure is low, if you can drink some water quickly, that will that will get it up quite a bit. Um, and then these are counter maneuvers that. Probably a lot of patients have done um, just uh, figuring out themselves uh, ways to increase the blood pressure. Um, you know, pretty much squeezing all the muscles in your body will increase your blood pressure, uh, especially the legs. There's a lot of blood in the in the muscles in the legs. Uh, this is what fighter pilots uh, used to do before G suits. You know, if they were feeling like they're going to pass out in, in low gravity, uh, kind of tense all the muscles to increase the blood pressure. And uh, squatting is probably one of the best things, you know, if you're able to do it. You can see here, this is a, um, the pointer's not coming there, but the lowest, uh, the bottom graph there, you can see the blood pressure jump up uh, on squatting. So what do we do if these uh, maneuvers don't work? Um, there are several medications that we use to increase blood pressure. Mitadrin, flugicortisone or Florinef, uh, Pritostigmine or Mestinon, uh, and Droxidoba or Northera. The, the choice on which of you know which one of these to use first it, it depends on a few factors. Um, if uh, if patients have that that was really high blood pressure laying flat, we may not tend to use the Florinef as much because it's a very long acting medicine. Um, Mitadrin is more easily available uh, and, and short acting, maybe lasts uh, three four hours at a time. So um, that's, that's one that we, we use quite frequently. And um, Droxidopa is a newer medication. It is, it is very effective, uh, and it's, um, you have less, uh, less of the supine high blood pressure with Droxidopa. It's just been very challenging recently for, uh, for our Medicare patients to get this covered. Uh, so, so the price is, has been um, quite a limitation. So just in closing, when should you see an autonomic specialist? Well. If you have a diagnosis of MSA, probably everyone should see an autonomic specialist because you know almost everyone has autonomic uh, dysfunction. But if you feel that you have symptoms that are clearly worse when you stand, <clears throat> we, if there's some postural component, it doesn't have to be lightheadedness, even um, you know some shortness of breath or fatigue. But if you feel like you sit down, lay down, it's much better. You stand up, it gets worse. It could be uh, related to your blood pressure dropping. Of course, if you've, you're having fainting spells, I mean, that's, uh, that's a red flag to, uh, to be evaluated or at least have your doctor check uh, your blood pressure. 
And if your doctor is noticing, noticing that there's um, what we call labile blood pressures, there's big highs and, and, and lows, big swings in the blood pressure. Um, there's a lot of other autonomic symptoms that I didn't uh, touch on because they're going to be covered by our other uh, physicians today. But um, constipation, um, going to the bathroom frequently, urinating frequently, uh, incontinence. So these are all uh, due to dysfunction of these autonomic nerves as well. And of course, if uh, the diagnosis is not clear and there's still uh, consideration of Parkinson's disease, sometimes the testing we do, like the sweat testing, uh, can be helpful for the diagnosis. All right, thank you very much.